I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today is a published author and playwright. Um, he's won Green Room Awards. Hello, you like that? That's pretty special in itself. Uh, and he's had a, 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 one of his plays that's actually been made into a short film that has gone on overseas and won many, many awards. And also his plays have gone overseas as well. Uh, but um, the one, you know, like the short film, it would, went to Canada, it went to the UK, it went to um, the US. Uh, so, you know, like, hello. Uh, and he is a businessman as well, because he has to make a living. The book's probably, you know, like, it's making him zilch. Uh, he's nodding here, so I, I guess that's right. Uh, so, in his day job, he's got a successful uh, software company. And uh, he, he uses p computer programs to help creative writing. But I've got to ask him, how does he see AI taking over on that front? Um, and he just, mm, his eyebrows went up. Uh, his latest project uh, as an author is a very interesting story. I don't want to give too much away, but it was when his mum was in a nursing home and experienced it there. Gorgeous story, I almost finished the book. I don't want to finish it, because you know when you read a book and it's really good, it's one that I want to keep hold of. So let's meet this man who's done so much and is a businessman at the same time as being a creative person. Mark, hello and welcome. Thanks, David. Uh, so where did the interest come with writing for you? Uh, I was in New York for a year uh, back in the late 90s. and How um, did you end up there? midlife crisis. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I connected with a couple of people who were produce, producing a musical. Um, uh, and so I said, how can I be part of this? So I, I spent a year there doing that and got to see a lot of shows and met a lot of people. And I'd always been interested in storytelling and wrote something that was awful. <laughs> uh, and, and thankfully I was told that it was awful. Um, was, was that a book or a play? That was a play. Right, okay. Yeah, I still have the script. Right. And it's still awful. Yeah. Um, so I didn't do anything with that. Um, came back here and I had the idea of a monologue. Um, and that's what led to Chasing Rabbits. That's the play that was made into a short film. Yep. Uh, so we did that here in, um, oh, it was part of Mono Feast back in you know, 2000 or something, 1999. And it did well and that's went overseas to a few festivals. And, and, and who, who made the film? Uh, a director called Sion Michel yep. directed it. An actor called Peter Hardy starred in the play and the film. He passed away just not long ago ah, in Western Australia. Right. Um, and Peter brought the character to life. Yeah. Um, but what, what does it mean to you, Mark, you know, like to have uh, such success with um, a short film that you wrote? It, it's strange because, um, it, you know, I, I don't feel that I created that. Uh, you know, what other, do you mean by that? Well, you know, I, I wrote the script, but yeah. other people, Peter performed it, Sion directed it, right, other okay. people brought it to life. And I think you're being humble here. Uh, no, it, I mean, imposter syndrome is real, I think. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, there's, there's part of that in this. But I, look, I feel good. Um, I, when, when I write something and it moves people emotionally, it's hard to know kind of how to react sometimes because, you know, when you're writing it, you're in a moment and then the next day, of course, it's dreadful. You know, you wake up and you think, I can't believe that I spent a day doing that. Ah. And so that, that's a very real, see, I think a lot of writers feel that. And so um, when somebody else connects with it, it's, you know, it's kind of strange. Yeah, and it would be, and it would be. All right, so I'm just going to jump around a little bit here mm. and, and talk about you as a businessman and um, you know, like what, what you're doing there. Uh, what, why did you do that? Was it, as I said, you know, to make money? Um, yeah, look, I, I failed high school, uh, didn't go to university, um, got a job with the CSIRO and learnt a lot about technology. And early on... Um, there was this kind of realization that if I had to, if I wanted to achieve something, I had to do it myself. Yep. Um, and you know, kind of remember sitting on the train from Pakenham to Melbourne one day and 
sort of a realization, uh, strange as it sounds. And so I thought, you know, I've got to create something where I can earn an income, not just based on my time. So writing software was part of that. And I learned about, you know, how to write good software. And I had an idea from when I worked in a shop back in high school. And I, I was very lucky to be there in the early stages of the personal computer era. But also you have to have that sort of brain because I couldn't do that. I have no concept of it. You know, like, yes, I, you know, like my mobile phone is my, my best friend uh, and, um, and you know, like, and I'm sending emails and whatever all the time. But I would, I, I could not set that up in life. So, you know, here you are, a, your, your creative mind and your business mind, the software mind as well. Yeah, I always saw programming as being a creative pursuit. If I'm writing code, I'm, I might as well be writing words. I haven't coded for many, many, many years. Um, but I, I think they're similar creative pursuits. You're creating something that somebody's going to get joy out of and, in, and enjoy in whatever they're doing, whether it's business or reading a story. So uh, both of them feel similar to me. Um, the business just continued on. And, you know, I uh, there was a period of about 15 or so years when I didn't write anything at all. Ah. Um, so there was what, this... What, you were concentrating on the business? Concentrating on the business, yep. you know, life changes, things like that. Um, and so it was actually towards the start of this book that things sort of sparked up and I'm like, okay, I, I think I could do this again. And this is the road I would go down. Right, okay. Well... I mentioned it in the little intro, um, AI, you know, like, can you know, what's your thoughts on being a writer mm. and being a software person as well? AI is scary um, because, you know, if you think of my software company, we've got 10 or 11 people who work on our help desk yep. and they rely on information that we've taught them over the years. So we've got about 800 what we call articles in our knowledge base on the knowledge about our software. So we recently fed that into an AI platform to see if it could answer questions for customers, and it can. Whoa. And so it's taking knowledge that we've built up over time that we train people on, but it can do it and eliminate the people. Now, I, I think AI is incredibly scary, not only in business, but creatively mm -hmm. as well, because it's able to do visual things, it's able to write words. You're able to give it some dialogue and say, can you improve that and tweak it more for an Irish audience, for example, and it can do that. Whoa. And 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 I think we've got to, as a, as a population, we've got to think, you know, do we want to be entertained by something that's, you know, machine driven and manipulated that way, or do we want it to come from the heart? And that's what AI hasn't got at the moment. It hasn't got the heart, it hasn't got the emotion. But Mark, do you think that's going to develop? It will come. Yeah. And, and that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so it's scary for somebody like you yeah. that's on the edge of, you know, like the, a creative front, and although you know, like the software side you see as creative as well, but you know, like you understand it a lot more than the, you know, like people like myself. I think that you know, if you think back to history and what we learned about the industrial revolution and how that played out for the world, really changed work. I think AI is going to have a, a bigger impact than that. Whoa. And and I Whoa. think that's where governments have got to, uh, you know, it's almost a little late to try and get the genie back yeah, in the bottle. because they're not going to be able to stop it now, are no. they? It's so, and the fact is, how will we know in the end? We won't, and that's why personal interaction with people, human to human, yep. is so important. Yep. Live theatre is so important. You know, all of that, that can't be AI driven. Film can, TV can, yep. but not live. And I think live is going to be more important. Oh, okay. And and we, you know, with people working from home a lot nowadays yeah. as well, going out is a critical part, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, like, as a matter of fact, I was out last night and um, uh, and somebody said, oh, the reason we do this is that I'm working from home all day long mm -hmm. and I need to, to get out. It's a weekly event that they go to. And I went, oh, that's interesting that that's the reason you're doing this and doing it on a regular basis, yeah, going well, it's out. It's part of our need as humans. We've, we need to interact with each other. Yeah. And, and again, AI can't replace that. You know, you can get AI pets. There's, a, there's an app in, I think it's Japan, where you can sign up for it, give it some details about what you look for in a friend, and the AI will be your email friend, your text friend. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's... It starts to Whoa. learn what you're interested in politically and sports-wise, and it has those conversations. And it's, it's scary. Yeah. 
All right, something that's not scary and something that's absolutely wonderful is this book here. This book here. What's it called? Well, even though everyone just saw what it's called. <laughs> not Dead Yet. Okay. Um, tell us how it started. What, what was the reasoning for this book? So in 2017, mid-2017, uh, my mum, who was in her mid-80s at that stage, she fiercely independent, uh, had been living in a retirement village for about 20 years. Uh, she'd had a series of falls and, and really needed more careful care. Um, five children were all very busy and not too many of us were sort of local to where she was living. Okay. So we found a place in a, a good nursing home, really good nursing home actually in Berwick. And how did she react to being put in? To a nurse it was her choice. Oh, she, okay. She very much lent into it. Right. Okay. Um, oh, that's not nice. because there's a lot of um, uh, re, you know, yeah. like, you know, hatred and, and blame the children all the way through. No, she had the choice. She had the choice over the timing. She chose the room. Okay. Um, and you know, it, from that point of view, there was a lot of care and thought put into it. She also knew that it would be. She couldn't live by herself any longer. It was just difficult. Yeah. So um, she moved in, but. You know, mum had things she wanted done a certain way. So uh, some of us in the family soon got into the process of, you know, I would do mornings and my sister who was living in Mildura at the time moved to Melbourne and spent months with her as well. Oh my God, so, that's a, you know, like, so, you're, you're so nice that you, you've done that. Well, look. That you did that. <laughs> you know, we try, but I, she wasn't living at my place, so it wasn't necessarily perfect. But, you know, I, I would go and, uh, and if I couldn't, my daughter would go and we would prepare breakfast for her. And So you just, went almost virtually every day? Every day I was in Melbourne, yeah. Yep. And just that process of being there and being around the nursing home yeah. process. Yeah. You hear the sounds, you smell the smells. Um, and, you know, in the book I make a, a passing comment about uh, there is no boiling water for example, you, because it's unsafe. Yep. Um, and so you go to the kitchen and there's an urn, but the urn is warm. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I did that. And then mum passed away just on a year later. And uh, it was a little while after that, that a thought came to me of a particular character and what it might be like for that person moving into a nursing home. And that was the beginning of a short story. Uh, I wrote that. I was pretty happy with that after a couple of months. And then somebody said, well, you know, why don't you make this into something bigger than a short story? And I hadn't thought about that and I did. And over time, you know, two or three years, it evolved into what it is now. Yeah. The characters coming up with them, were a lot of them used from your time spent at the nursing home or, you know, like that just gave you a little hint of where you could go? Probably one or two incidental characters are people I saw at the nursing home. Yep. None of the main characters are, but being there every day, uh, walking through and, and just talking with people, it, you know, it, it obviously plays a role in giving you inspiration and, and motivation. Yeah. Uh, so t tell our, our viewers, what are some of the characters, you know, like, who are they? You know, like, because they're such interesting people that you've created. So congratulations on that. Um, there's a character called Alexander. Oh, who, yes. <laughs> um, you know, he, he lives by himself. Yeah. And he's made a decision he needs to go into a nursing home. And no matter how much he's prepared for it, he's not prepared for it. Yeah. And the, the, the story takes us through his journey of going in and the adjustments he has to make as a person to nursing home life, and then ultimately the contribution he makes to nursing home life. And, you know, it, it slowly explores the Alexander journey uh, in, in a way that I think is, it's unusual for an older character's story to be told that way. Yeah, and the fact is that, you know, like getting his name right. Yes, very much so. Uh, because he was very much, he was very fastidious about how he wanted things to be and they just couldn't fit his name on a name tag, you know, so. Uh, you know. And, that, and that's on the front cover as well, which is, is very funny, which when you first look at it, you go, I don't understand no. that, but you know, like re reading it uh, explains it all. Uh, give us a, one of the other characters. Um, there's a character called Thomas uh, and this is set in, uh, I think it's the late 80s, and uh, Thomas is incontinent. 
And so the story tries to explore how he deals with that. And ultimately, it's his grandson who has to help him deal with it, which is, is complex because, yeah. you know, his, his daughter is too busy to be able to come and do it. She sends her son instead. And uh, Thomas is having to confront what that is like. And um, I've had a few people who've read that story and felt connected to it because, first of all, incontinence is not something people talk about or want to talk about. Mm. Um, and secondly, uh, certainly incontinence for men, you know, it's, it's almost a taboo subject in some respects. And well, is, is that a, a man thing, though? It's isn't? not. It's not? Uh, oh, no, you mean as in, in terms yeah, of like talk, not wanting to talk about probably. it? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with Thomas, you know, um, uh, it, it, he's not my grandfather, but I was reminded of my grandfather. He died in his 90s, mid-90s. Um, and, you know, the last few years of his life were difficult because so much of what he had had been taken away from him in terms of his flexibility as to how he lived and yeah. all of that. And, and uh, that's part of what happens, obviously, to your body as you get older. Mm. And so through Thomas, I was trying to explore that. And you just mentioned, because it was something I was going to ask you, that, that people have said they, they understood where you were going with it, because mm. that can be the hard thing when you're writing, Mark, as well, is, you know, like, and making up these stories, uh, although that was roughly on your, your, your grandfather, but, you know, like, you were making up this story, and, and it's an important story, yeah. but you got it right. Uh, look, I, I feel that I did. There are probably eight or nine stories that I didn't include because I didn't feel the same way about them. What I did do early on in the process, uh, I used a lot of what they call beta readers. These are people who love to read fiction as it's being developed. Ah, um, you don't, I've never heard of that. So you don't know them. They're yeah. Like, I, I don't know who it's they are. It's almost like an editor in a way. Yeah, well, yeah. it is, but they're not providing they're not editing, editing feedback. Yeah. Uh, their feedback is more... Um, this is what I enjoyed about it. This is what I didn't enjoy about it. So through various beta reader groups, you can you can ask for male or female, older, younger, um, overseas, from yeah. Australia, whatever. Yeah. And so I got some really good feedback early on. And, and with once you have a sense from two or three stories that they're sort of landing the way you hope they would, that's what gives you confidence to go forward. Right, okay. That that's something that I've learnt today. You know, I'm I'm happy. I've learnt something today about the beta beta readers. Beta readers. Yeah. Uh, how did you know about them? Or is it because you're you're in the biz? No, no, not at all. I'm not that much in the biz. Well, yeah, no, you're a writer, and you've had you know a, a few out. I'm good researching, and so oh. I I I knew that I needed feedback. I did not want feedback from anybody I knew. Okay. I didn't want to go to family, yep. didn't want to go to my yep. partner, yep. anybody. Uh, I, I needed feedback from people I would never have to look in the eye <laughs> because I think I'm more likely to get an honest opinion. True. Um, and so through that research, I joined some writers groups on Facebook and ah. then somebody mentioned beta reading and I thought, okay. what's that? Yep. So I then did some research and found out there are specific beta reader groups and you know, it's a whole community. And, uh, you know, you can put it out there and, and overnight you could have 25 people put their hand up and say, yeah, I'd like to read that. Wow. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a whole thing. Fantasy fiction is big at the moment. And uh, it was funny that um, one of the beta readers early on said, I'll read anything so long as it's not fantasy fiction, because I think they're a bit sick of reading fantasy fiction. Yeah. So how many did you write for the, this book uh, be before, before you then chose what was in it? Look. 21 or 22. Okay. How many are in it? Uh, I think it's, well, th there's a section that's shorts. Yep. And so you've got really short stories. True. But there's a, about 11 okay. in there today. Yeah. yeah. How hard was it choosing those 11? You know, like, th is that where the editor came into play? No, I, I made those choices oh, okay. myself. Yep. Uh, I didn't give the editor most of the ones that I discarded because right. I didn't feel good about them. Okay. Um, so it's hard because... Uh, I mean, there are a couple of stories that I felt good about, but I just don't think they fitted what this was. Um, you know, this is a collection of stories about people who are in a nursing home. 
And while I explore, you know, in one of the stories, there's a, a, a sexuality discussion um, and others have other sort of subtopics. The reality is the focus has got to be still within that world. And I felt that I was, with some of the other stories, I was diver diverging too far from that. Yeah. So what, what happened when, when you went to a publisher? Is the publisher that you've used before? No. At all, no. a new publisher. Okay. Was that scary or good? a good thing? It was a good process because their process is that they'll give you honest feedback. Yep. Uh, and the editor that they assigned me to, he was fantastic. Uh, and he went through two processes, two solid edit processes with the book. And the thing that's interesting is he, like so many other people who've read various drafts of it, they want to share their own stories about ah. a grandmother, a grandfather, okay. a parent, yeah. and they talk about their personal connection. And, and I think that was interesting. But the publisher itself, uh, they've been an absolute joy to work with. Yeah, well, well that, that's re really good. Because you're putting a lot of faith in them, aren't you? you know, yeah. like, I, I know that they're in, in very important and they, they know their business and you being a businessman as well. But you, you, you know, like, you're putting a lot of faith in them, aren't you? You are. And it's a complex world. I mean, you mentioned AI before, but mm. now with the world of, of uh, instant digital printing, for example, um, you release a book and there's a physical version of the book, but overseas uh, booksellers are actually going to access it from a digital platform mm. and print it through their own, you know, printing mechanisms. Yeah. And so it's it's quite different to how it was even five years ago. Yeah. Is it international publisher or...? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's uh, available in Canada, the US, the UK. Um, you can find it on the Barnes and Noble website, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, and did that happen because you, you know, like you've been overseas, you've had a bit of success overseas, or was it just they their decision? Their decision as to to where it's gone, and right. that's the process they've gone through. They made it very very easy from that point of view. Yeah. Um, the one question I wanted to, and the more I read it, the more I, and knowing your background, is is there a play in this? Um, I I think there is. Look, in a few areas? Possibly. Um, you know, th theatre is interesting. There's a lot of change occurring with live theatre. Um, you know, Broadway shows are not running as long as they used to, and not that I'm thinking of Broadway or anything, but it's. I think uh, how we tell stories is changing. And, um, you know, uh, having done both and, and also the, the short film, I like this format. I like the printed word format. Okay. Because once you're done and you put it out there, yeah. it can find its own way. Yeah. With a play, um, you've got to get bums on seats every night and, you know, it's it's a whole different world. Yeah. And more stressful. And more stressful. Oh, absolutely. Well, would you give it to somebody and say, hey, you know, like, will you look at this, a playwright? Uh, look, I'd be happy for them to. I Personally, I... Uh, you know, if, if I if I was putting a wish to some, you know, genie or someone like that, I would say um, a mini series with each episode about a different character. Oh, That's yes. That's what I would think. Yeah, there you go. You, you know, know, like you're a step ahead of me already. <laughs> That's the perfect, perfect way for it to go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a, a mini series because yeah, like you would be squashing too much in if it was a play. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what what's the next step then if you've already thought of that? Have, have you maybe, you know, like, would the publisher help you in that? Um, the publisher has mentioned it. Okay. Um, so we'll kind of see where that goes. Uh, we're in the process of pushing the baby out at the moment. Yep. So, yep. Uh, but look, I would like to see if they could explore that further. I think that's interesting. Yeah, well, and also uh, the, the minute I, I, I saw this book and uh, started, um, you know, like scanning through it a little bit before I started reading it, um, I, I just thought this is such a top, a very topical, mm. um, you know, like matter right this very minute, with so many baby boomers, with mm. you know, like their their parents, you know, like already gone through the process and are out the door, um, or I, I know so many people that are talking about it right now, mm. you know, like about their their aging parents, or I've got an aging sister. Um, who you know, like, is in this sort of situation. Uh, and so therefore it's very topical, isn't mm. it? Uh, look, I think it's very current. And um, you know, I'm 
just kind of fortunate that it's coming out at this time when there's a real interest in how we care for older people in our community. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like, here, here we go. Have you all of a sudden started thinking about another book because of, of this? You know, like the fact that, okay, it's early stages with this one, but, um, you know, like, is, is there something else that's triggered you now to... Yeah, look, I, I like the idea of uh, short stories around a situation where yep. a diverse so group of people yep. meet. Yep. And so I have a couple of ideas I'm exploring in that space. Um, we'll see where we get to. Okay, and is it, you know, like with uh, a lot, lot of cases now, are you going back instead of the, the nursing home? Uh, is it about youth or something? Could, you know, like go the opposite direction? No, actually, I, I think I'm more likely to explore older people partly because if you look at a lot of the entertainment today, it's, it doesn't really feature older people and, or, you know, it's quite rare. And so I think there are some interesting stories, some unexpected stories from boomers and beyond mm. that could be interesting to look at. Well, there's a new musical that's uh, happening at Melbourne Theatre Company at present. Um, Bloom. Yep, yeah, which yeah. is all about... Um, uh, a nursing home yeah. a, as well, um, and all of all of a sudden I, I related to it yeah. because I've seen it and yeah. you know, I related to it as well. It's a great musical. It's a great musical and very clever, especially yeah. considering who it's from as, as well. I I think it's all, all real, really good. So wh where where do you see yourself as a writer in five years' time or ten years' time? You've got your business that's going along nicely until um, a. <laughs> Yeah, it takes over. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, but where where do you where do you see yourself? You know, like, do you want to keep on? Because you'd stop there for a while, hadn't you? Yeah. Be before this book, uh, I'd like to, in five years' time, maybe have another couple of books out. I'd like to. Um, I certainly have one that I'm. You know, starting to progress a little. Oh, are you? Um, oh, you, so. you've opened up a bit there because you didn't say that to begin with. Um, you know, I. I've, I've written a play with some songs um, and, you know, I'd like to see something happen with that. I think it's pretty good. Uh, okay, hold on a minute. I'm going to pull you up there. You just said you don't like the, the play I know, thing. I know. So, so here's the thing. I, I've looked at that and I thought, well, do I take that and present that in a book form? It doesn't have to be told on stage. Oh, okay. I, the story itself, I think, is a good story. Um, and so I've just wondered whether whether the medium is is wrong for that. Yeah. Just because I, I do see, I mean, I, I love live theatre. I go to live theatre a lot. But, oh, it's it's just to get something up on stage is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. I'm not afraid of work, but it's a lot of work. Uh, and the cost, the cost yeah. of it is the other, other side of it. Well, don't give up on that because, mm. you know, like, I think it's really important, as we said earlier, that people want to go out. They, mm. they want entertainment and all that. So don't give up on it. But, you know, like with this as a mini series, um, the book, maybe, um, you know, like go to producers um, and make it into... Uh, you know, you, you play, your musical, in into, you know, like something for the screen. If only it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've got an audience right this very moment yeah. that um, uh, could be thinking, oh, yeah, you know, like th this guy's got it. Uh, so wh what about the plays that have they've come and gone? Mm. Uh, do you, you know, like, because this is where I, I think it's re really sad in a way for a, a lot of um, writers is that where where is it now? Yeah. You know, like, Look, it's interesting. Um, Chasing Rabbits, the first one, yep. uh, every, look, probably every two or three months, I get contacted by a college student, typically in the US, uh, who's looking for a 20 minute monologue. Whoa. And uh, so it's, it's certainly has been used in college settings uh, for students who are presenting a monologue as part of their, their drama degree. Um, so it has a bit of life like that. Okay. Oh, um, how lovely. You know, which is just really sweet to hear. Yeah. I really yeah. enjoy that. Yeah. Um, and the others, look, uh, uh, you know, there was one dating Joe that was... Yes, uh, I was going to ask you about that, which did very well. It did really well here and in Minneapolis, actually. Yep. 
Robert Van Mecklenburg, Melbourne actor, starred in that, did an amazing job. And, um, you know, that was back in the days of video dating. You know, he's holding the, the camera to his face and recording it on a VHS or something. And, and so, you know, that world has changed. Uh, we have dating apps and things like that now. Yeah. So... Um, you might have to do a bit uh, of rewrite. Maybe. Uh, pr prob probably not with that. Um, but look, you know, I think writers are good at putting something out there and then their view is whatever happens from there happens. Yep. I'll work on the next writing project. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I just think you're wonderful. This book is a wonderful book. Congratulations Thank on you. it. And especially considering where it came from and the way you you, know, like it, you, you hadn't been writing for a while and to, to write this, um, you're a very good writer and I'm so pleased to have met you and I can't wait to see, see it into um, a mini series. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, thank you so much. Thanks, David. You've been watching The Art Hunter. I'm David Hunt and we'll be back again real soon. We're almost to that 100th episode. See ya.